Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. What are some concrete steps to take to ensure free speech on campus? What would inclusive freedom mean, where the rights and obligations of all students, faculty and staff are equally protected? Join me in a conversation with Sigal Ben Porad, professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the chair of its Committee on Freedom of Expression. Her most recent book, Free Speech on Campus, was published in 2017 and lays out an idea of inclusive freedom that would answer these questions. Welcome. I'm very, very happy today. I have Professor Sigal Ben Porat, who is Professor of Education, Political Science and Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania here today. First of all, if I can call you Sigal, hi, welcome to the podcast. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, it's, it's really great. I've read, obviously, your most recent book, which we're going to focus on, Free Speech on Campus, which is an exploration of the tensions and the kind of opportunities arising out of the free speech debates and as I understand, you were the chair of the University of Pennsylvania's Committee on Open Expression a while back, which grappled with these issues. And I still am the chair, actually, of oh. the committee. Yes, so it's kind of a longer term commitment. Oh, right that's, now, that's actually I'm good. I'm still doing that work. You mm -hmm. haven't resolved every issue yet, it seems, right? Not yet. Almost there, but not yet. <laughs> Almost there. So, and then several other books you've written. One is Citizenship Under Fire democratic education in times of conflict. And another book is Tough Choices, Structured Paternalism and the Landscape of Choice. And these books deal with similar issues in a way with the twin goals of equality and freedom and democracy and how to exercise our individualized personal choices with the recognition that some choices will have to be made for us by others, sort of you're trying to work through these kinds of struggles which are endemic to a democracy and not just education. So I was quite interested that you are coming out of this work to think of the links between education and democracy, between equality and freedom, and then arrived at writing this book on free speech on campus now, which has been, you know, widely discussed and, you know, received really, I think, really good recognition from people who are engaging with your position. Yeah, thank you for this introduction for the overarching themes in my work, which I have to say not everybody can see. And even I sometimes lose track of, especially because a lot of my earlier work focused on children, on schools, public schools or K-12 schools, and also on settings that affect families and children more so than on young people in a college setting. I really thought more about schools as contexts in which we educate the majority, the vast majority of the next generation of citizens. And so my interest in democracy and education and in the practice and efforts that we make towards preparing the next generation of citizens overall as a cohort, right? Really focused more on younger people, on, on institutions that serve really most or almost all of them. So therefore the focus on schools. And it has been my work on Penn's Committee on Open Expression that really made me think more systematically about the work that we do in colleges, which, of course, because they don't serve the whole population, they just serve, right, a selective part of it. I was not focusing on them as much in my earlier work as contexts in which we train for democracy, right? I worried that people who think about colleges as a main locus for training for democracy really leave out those people who don't go to college and about whom 
we too often, you know, we are just willing not to think about them because they do tend to participate less often. They do tend to be either less informed or less engaged if you look at surveys. And so it's easy to say, oh, college graduates or what's happening in colleges, this is what is affecting democracy most significantly. And I reject that. I don't think that's true. However, through, of course, my work at Penn generally as a prof- as somebody who interacts with students, and most significantly the open expression work, it became clear to me that some of the work that we do in universities and some of the ways that this work is perceived publicly really does have a broader impact on our democratic structures and institutions and culture beyond what it is that we do with and for our students. So that's where it connects. You raise really an interesting question that actually K through 12, that primary education is for in all countries, really, all governments take a great amount of interest in that level of education because that actually is where citizens are formed and trained and where certain ideals or norms are instilled. But the free speech debate doesn't take place really much around high schools. It's actually sort of, it's interesting that freedom of expression and freedom of speech is centered on colleges, which you point out in some ways inadvertently or maybe deliberately leaves out a lot of people who don't go to college. I mean, maybe more than half of high school graduates in America go to college now, which is an amazing, remarkable achievement, but it still leaves out a good number of people. So it's interesting that your initial work sort of comes out of thinking how are democratic citizens formed because they don't fall from the sky. They're not born and not little infants who wake up one day and decide to be democratic citizens. And But at the same time, college has become this focal point to think about what does it mean to be a democratic person? What does it mean to be a citizen, to be fully engaged, informed, etc.? So this is actually interesting to note that, that, and, you know, from a political and legal perspective, somehow just free speech is not a big issue in schools. It's regulated in high schools in very different ways. There are actually precedents that the courts have recognized restrictions or regulations on speech they wouldn't recognize for universities because they think people are younger and not capable quite of sorting through different things in the same way. The court have this, it's not a condescending attitude, it's more of these are not fully formed um, adults. And so the American court system has recognized high school as a different place. It's so true. And actually I would add another aspect to it, which I think is very important also for colleges to recognize which is that not only are courts more and more in the last four decades or so recognizing, as you just now said, high school students and younger as not fully formed citizens and therefore as looks at schools and other institutions as appropriately restricting their freedoms, including their freedom of expression, but also the courts more and more are Thinking about schools, this is even more disconcerting to me, right? Because there is something reasonable about saying, look, you know, kids are still young. They still can't vote. They are not, you know, citizens in the full sense of the term. We're still training or preparing them. So there is something reasonable about that, I think, or more intuitive. However, more and more the courts are thinking about schools or framing the work in schools as work that is meant towards training people for the workplace, And so they are very readily restricting students' civil rights, including their free expression rights, as irrelevant to the work of schools. So they are basically saying, and this is a trend that has continued ever since, you know, in the Tinker decision during the Vietnam War, the decision was made that students are permitted to express their political opinions, in that case, opposition to the Vietnam War by wearing a black armband. Ever since then, when kids were recognized as at least worthy of expressing their political views, the courts are restricting more and more types of speech, whether it's political speech, student newspapers, sexual innuendo or like jokes that teenagers might make that may seem like off color or inappropriate or even using banners and other forms of uh, written expression, the courts more and more are permitting 
schools to restrict speech and to punish speech because it disrupts the learning environment. And this really frames the learning environment as targeted towards making sure that you get these topics or this information into your little head, right? So it's a very materialistic kind of vision of learning. I'm the teacher, I know something. You're the student, you don't know that. Let me put it into your head so that you are prepared to do the job that I'm training you to do versus thinking about schools as little training grounds for citizenship, which I would like for us as a country, right, as a democratic country to think about them at least additionally in this way. I think actually citizenship training should be their primary goal. I see it as the primary justification for a public education system. But even if you dispute that and you say, look, you know, schools actually should prepare you to have a good job or to make a living or to contribute to the economy, which I view as a secondary job, maybe other people have other priorities, that's fine. Still, we have to recognize that the civic training component is central to the justification for a public schooling system, to the requirement that it is publicly funded and supported, and to the work that we actually do. And so when we silence students, we are basic, high school students, I mean, we're basically telling them, oh, don't worry your little head with civic stuff and having opinions and expressing them. That's irrelevant finish your homework first. And so when these kids get into college, they have pretty much zero training in forming and expressing opinion in an institutional setting, right? They we're, come we're, to college. We're quite in the middle of your argument already from which you lay out in the free speech on campus, which you call right. that there's another way of looking at this as inclusive freedom. But just to go back to what you said, there's, there are several ways of looking at this. They're saying that kids are not encouraged to just express themselves freely. This goes, you know, this is not just justices, but the court of public opinion weighs in on this. So we have, you know, liberals decrying kind of a politically correct culture. We have ultra conservatives deriding and really criticizing students for speaking out on the Second Amendment. So we've seen this, which is quite interesting that high school students from the Parkland shooting in Florida have right. been severely attacked by conservatives who consider themselves free speech absolutists on every front, especially when it comes to defending racists, white supremacists, homophobic, transphobic, sexist speech. They say absolutist, except when high school students speak out against the Second Amendment. That should not be accepted, tolerated, or allowed. So you have both sides struggling in this space. So we're in a space where there's really some contention of what would be good. And I think you're right to a point, but I also think, and I wonder how you think about this when you have freshmen coming to the University of Pennsylvania or when I'm teaching freshmen, a lot of them are quite aware of the speech debates. And a lot of them have quite sophisticated ways of explaining to me why it's unacceptable, for example, to use a really prevalent example for youth culture, for white students to use the N-word but it is actually acceptable for their African-American friends to use it. They actually can lay that argument out. They have references. They've looked at it. They know people from ta Coates to Toni Morrison to Drake to say, this is to the TV show Dear White People, they say. We understand these issues are here. We've thought about them quite a lot. We kind of think actually administrators and judges don't get it which is interesting. So I think there is, it comes to campus already with many different opinions, right? Well, so first of all, I think both your students and my students are generally sometimes more, had an opportunity to be well prepared, broadly read than maybe the median student around the country. So if you look at the overall cohort of 18-year-olds, I'm not sure that your description just now would cover most of them, although surely, generationally speaking, we can easily say that the younger generation now is significantly more attuned 
as you're just now saying, to the tensions between open expression and a respectful and inclusive environment. So even as they haven't practiced a lot of this in an institutional setting because their high school newspaper can be censored and their speech in the class and outside of class can be prevented or punished, etc. So the legal protections for them so far have been very limited. But still, because this has become such an important cultural phenomenon, right, and because it is a part of our political debate, broadly speaking, outside the university, they don't need to wait to get into college to think about these things in the same way that they think about other cultural dimensions of our debate right now. And they probably think maybe a little less about what can be punished. And I, I'm not sure if there's so many cases where high school speech is legally punished. I think there's um, what I would consider regulation that what most Americans would consider hate speech, certain terms are not acceptable in a classroom. I've asked my own students and my own children around the dinner table, I say, don't you feel restricted in your American fundamental First Amendment rights if you cannot use a certain word? And they all looked at me and said, absolutely not. That is unacceptable in a school. It doesn't contribute to the learning environment. And there's no need to invoke a First Amendment or free speech claim when we're looking at people hurling insults at one another. So they don't experience it as repression. The other part... They've been on the internet as digital natives longer than we have because their whole lifetime, which was longer than our lifetimes in a strange way. And so I think they're very aware of a lot of other debates that are going very fast on the internet that actually, you know, what is acceptable, what can be said, what kind of insults can be there, and are there any lines to cross? And there's different protocols, obviously. So I'm not sure if they experienced it as a kind of repressive high school experience. They couldn't say what they wanted or we came out of high school doing quite well by knowing certain things you cannot say to other people. I've had a couple of your colleagues, so to speak, in a wider sense on this podcast. It's a professor, Stanley Fish, for example, who I've talked to quite a lot. And I said to him, what is so difficult about accepting that some people want to use different pronouns? that you as a professor of English and one of the master stylists of American English don't really accept. And he's come around to say, if I can paraphrase Stanley, say, actually, maybe it's not so difficult to learn something new, even late in life. So he said, the kids may be all right. They may tell me I want to be called they or I want to be called he. It's not for you to tell me what I should be called. So I think there's some room where they don't experience this speech debate as repressive or the courts intervening too much, but saying this is enabling other people to participate. I definitely don't think that they see it as repressive. And I actually really think that they are correct in that. So generationally speaking, I think they are just more sophisticated than we allowed ourselves to be generationally speaking again in saying, look, uh, if you give me a list of words that I can't say, that's not a very effective way of getting me to relate to other people in a respectful and civil manner or to have an interesting, productive, engaging debate with them, even across disagreement. So they are looking for more effective ways and more interesting ways to bridge our differences and connect to each other and to create shared platforms. And so our more blunt ways of saying, oh, you can't say that, you know, here are words you shouldn't use. They thought more, and as you said, through the internet and other cultural debates that we are having and that their generation are having, whether it's about popular culture, about, you know, through TV series or through other media, they are having a more nuanced debate, which I think some people, both on the left and on the right, are listening to and are calling the names for it or saying that they are overly sensitive or they are snowflakes or whatever. Maybe like every cultural debate, maybe sometimes it's being taken too far. I can definitely see examples of that where people are coming from what I see as appropriate democratic values of looking to include others and to be sensitive to their needs, 
and to make sure that they are not side that your peers right are not silenced especially your marginalized peers are not silenced in a conversation and that they have a platform that they can use or that you can share your own platform with them etc so maybe as they work through this process sometimes you can find occasions where it might look over where it's going too far maybe it is maybe it isn't you know Surely young people can make mistakes, you know, they can try things out and see how they work and sometimes they're not going to work perfectly. But back to your point about your conversation with Stanley Fish, this is one point I would agree with him and I'm not sure I would find many more, but I do think the kids are all right, right? I think their perspective of saying, look, how much does it cost you to use the preferred pronoun of a person, not by money, right? What is the cost to you? And what is the cost to them if you use the pronoun that you prefer because you're comfortable with that or that's what you're used to, but you're actually silencing them or harming them or effectively causing them to be unable to participate in the conversation? right? Because you are addressing them in the wrong way, they're going to sit back and be silenced because they don't want to be addressed in this way. So they prefer not to participate. What, what, You're missing out as well. What it's they, not only just them. Or in the university setting, they're going to miss out and be by being silenced. Or they will speak out and say, you're referring to me in the wrong way. And if they say that over and go over it, they're wasting a lot of time where they should be contributing to the intellectual debate to say the terms of the debate are set up in the wrong way for me. It's if someone comes in and addresses you by the wrong name over and over and you have to keep on correcting them, you're just wasting time and it goes against the educational mission. So it interferes with something. But to stay with this for a moment, part of what my project is to sort of think about why is there this generational, this misunderstanding and why have so many people taken sides, as you said, to either call the, the younger generation coddled snowflakes and oversensitive and driven by feelings and emotions, which Aristotle reminded us the young are always driven by feelings and emotions, that irrational discourse is part of political discourse, that affect can overrule reason, and that this is the nature of the young forever. <laughs> and at the same time, Aristotle sort of lays the groundwork of what your project is, is civic education and educating people to become citizens. So where is this breakdown? And is it different from previous generations that instead of people getting together and saying this is the best way, and I think your effort in your book and Free Speech on Campus is to arrive at something like inclusive freedom that moves everyone forward and doesn't leave one of the two parties on the sidelines, either the kind of befuddled faculty and administrators who don't know what to do or who get very angry. And we have examples of people who are very angry. So Jordan Peterson, the psychologist from Canada, who has gone viral on the internet because he basically refused to call a trans person by their preferred pronoun. And that's gotten a huge amount of press and people thought finally someone spoke up because he thinks the cost to him is so high because somehow his entire integrity seems to be staked on being able to say whatever he wants. So I'm kind of interested, you want to shift into a space, how can you accommodate these different sides, which have been painted, as you said, unfairly maybe as too extreme or too stark? Well, I'm not sure that I can or even that I wish to accommodate everyone's perspective within my framework of inclusive freedom. But I would say that I'm trying to reframe the way that we understand each other across these two perspectives, especially the one you mentioned earlier of the free speech absolutist, right? And the one that is oftentimes attributed or represents more the younger generation, people who are looking to, you know, who are being portrayed as being driven by feelings and also being unrespectful towards First Amendment rights. And maybe even not understanding properly what free speech requires and entails. And I actually think that there is something useful in both of these accounts 
but I think you have to think about them together and how they fit together in order to move forward. So actually, I think the effort coming from the younger generation that seems as though it's an effort to silence speech or that is sometimes even not always in good faith, right? But sometimes even in good faith is portrayed as silencing, right? Oh, now I have to use the pronouns you say. I, you know, I can't say whatever I want or now I can't say racist things even if I think something racist or, you know, biased in some ways because it hurts your little feelings, right? So people are up in arms about themselves and their opinions being silenced or coerced in some ways. And I actually think that if we understand, especially in the campus context, right? Because the campuses have become a flashpoint for this conversation. If we think about the campus context as a more effective microcosm of democracy, Right. So it's a more well functioning democracy, usually. Um, and beyond that, as a democratic institution that has a mission, an educational mission, a research mission. And so we're thinking about this as a context where the most important aspect of speech is really not just the utterance. Right. Really not just what it is that I can say, but is the conversation or the dialogue that I can create among the different participants or members of campus, as well as between the campus members and other people outside. So the most important part is really to figure out ways by which we can continue the dialogue, even as we can maintain our differences. For the dialogue to continue, we have to make sure that everyone can participate. And I think free speech absolutely is should be read if they work in good faith and are not just trying to promote a certain political agenda through, you know, using free speech or the First Amendment as an excuse, right? But actually committing themselves to open expression, they should also be open to recognizing that if we have a certain part of the population that in an ongoing fashion cannot participate in the discussion, you cannot actually say that their free speech rights are protected, even if nominally or legally, they are not being restricted from speaking, right? So we have, as a campus, we have to model the context by which everyone is welcome to participate in the conversation and their contributions are not only just uttered, but also heard. So to get to the kind of difficult cases, what you're saying is that you have to assume good faith on both sides in a way. But you also said that there's free speech absolutism with the legal scholar Fred Schauer, who's also been on the podcast, who's a First Amendment professor at Harvard, now he's a University of Virginia professor. He said, he calls it First Amendment opportunism. When the First Amendment is applied to situations where it really doesn't have much to resolve. Robert Post thinks the First Amendment doesn't have that much to resolve in universities at all because universities regulate speech all the time based on whether it's useful for the production of knowledge, whether it is actually vetted and has been certified by experts. And because in universities, speech can be compelled. I can make my students take exams and write down answers, which the government wouldn't allow me to do if it was a pure free speech world. So what you're saying is you assume good faith on both sides. But we do know there's a lot of controversies that seem to erupt around the difficulty to, to look across these kind of divides and for people to assume someone coming in with explicitly racist view, views is really assume, sort of trying to do the best. And you bring up several examples in your book, Charles Murray, Milo Indianapolis, and Coulter is another one. And you actually say, well, you know, they're really there to sort of test the boundaries of speech and kind of understand what inquiry is. And a lot of other people say, not at all. They're actually there to provoke the campus. They're there to generate notoriety. And lastly, I think they're there to undermine the role of the university to be an arbiter of truth. So in some ways, the assumption of good faith I'm completely with you. We have to make it in universities all the time. But when it breaks down, how do you balance that out by saying, when I think I don't believe this speaker is acting in good faith at all, 
to have an intellectual conversation or debate. He just wants to promote some views that are incendiary to cause people to be upset. And the other students, maybe they just want to shut something down because they also want to be in the news. So it's driven by outside interests. So how do you get through this, which is the difficult cases when people lose their belief that other people are acting in good faith? Right. I will say that I definitely don't think many of the outside speakers that are going on the, you know, speaker circuit that holds the banner of free speech right now, I don't think they are coming in good faith to participate in a conversation about the boundaries of free speech. I think some of the speakers that you have mentioned just now and others I, I talk about in the book and that we see in the news are not coming with an effort to start a dialogue. They, in their minds, are looking to expose, so to speak, the university as being too left-wing or not accommodating of viewpoint diversity through using language and expressing perspectives that are unacceptable to a university context. And in this way, supposedly to show that universities are not good contexts for the First Amendment to be realized. In fact, universities, I think, universities and colleges today are the most effective context for practicing the First Amendment in the United States today. I think what we do as a sector every day really protects and also expresses a commitment to the First Amendment in myriad ways. And again, recognizing that we have limitations, we're not perfect, there are things to work on. Obviously, I'm not idealizing here, right? I'm in the trenches, I know the limitations. But I do see how the way that we are portrayed as a sector, especially through these speaking tours by outside speakers, undermines the more accurate description of the sector as a very committed to the daily life of the First Amendment, right? Expressing it in our daily lives. But I also think... think You could say that's how you know, the marketplace of ideas works. I think the representation of universities that our sector has been painted as in crisis, that these things are indicative of larger problems. I have a lot of colleagues who sort of agree and say, yeah, it's too liberal. There are not enough conservatives here. And maybe these people are a little out of control. They are a little bit provocative, but they're pointing to something larger that universities are leaning too much in one direction. In some ways, that undermines so much more than what their perception is because it undermines the capacity of universities to appoint qualified people because it makes it look like it's some partisan effort to only appoint liberals. So I think it's you're totally right. There were thousands of events at Yale University when the event happened around the Halloween costumes with Christakis couple. There have been thousands of events at Berkeley Berkeley has over 50 or 60,000 students who are debating and discussing things every single day with thousands of faculty. And then you have one Milo show up and the whole world thinks there's a crisis. And then half the world thinks free speech has ended in America. Why does it generate when you, because I think you're right, free speech is really enacted actively all day long in universities. I would add universities regulate speech all day long with no one right. having a problem. So. Right. You you know, we're talking right now because we both take a great interest in this topic. We've published on it. We've thought about it. You know, the vetting qualification, which is appropriate for a real conversation. But so why does it become this thing? Is, is it, and I wanted to connect it back to your other greater interests. It points to something in democracy right now, right? The larger political climate. It actually reveals something about where we are as a culture. Right. And I think some of the struggle right now against Uh, institutions of higher learning, as well as against the press, which I see as happening in parallel, and even against the judiciary, right? These are efforts to undermine uh, the shared platforms of conversations that we have as a country, shared institutions that can be looked at or looked up to 
as a country and also even institutions that are sometimes seen and this is slightly too grand of a phrase, right? But maybe the arbiters of truth or pipelines through which, you know, we can try out ideas and also vet them and try to move forward in our understanding of each other, of the world, of our society, etc. And I think undermining these institutions serves some political purpose, right? Which is why the campus is sometimes portrayed so negatively and also as well as the press, etc. And it's also why I think it's so important for individual institutions as well as for leaders in the sector overall and podcasters and others to try and express how actually in fact the institutions work, how truth, knowledge, productive forms of expression are elevated in this institution over other forms of expression, why you or I professionally, for instance, would be penalized for plagiarizing, whereas, for instance, a politician wouldn't be, right? So, or for lying, right? If I forge my data, right? This is professionally, you know, a very problematic step to take for myself, but not for people in other professions or for public utterances. There are some structural differences between the university and other parts of democracy. However, we serve a role that goes beyond just training people to work on Wall Street or whatever it might be that our students end up doing, right? We are not there to just try and advance the economy or to place teachers into schools or engineers into wherever it is that they might work, into Google and Apple. We are there also to try and prepare people for participating in broader society. And this is one way, along with the generation and production of knowledge, that we are contributing to larger society. And this is why we need to hold on to some of these practices and boundaries that we have around speech. Now, this doesn't mean at all that we should not welcome viewpoint diversity. Quite the opposite. Viewpoint diversity is at the heart of a lot of what we do. But it's not only just political diversity of viewpoints, it's all sorts of diversity of viewpoints. And if welcoming one type of diversity is, which is not done in good faith, undermines other forms, we have to create a balance for ourselves as individual institutions. What is the appropriate ways for us to welcome all different kinds of speech without silencing in the process some other speech, right? It's just a balancing act. And I think it is going to work differently at NYU than it would at Penn, than it would at historically black college or university, than it would in an all-women's college or in a community college, right? These are different institutions with their histories and values, and they have to do the balancing act individually. Can, can you say a little bit how or why they, the balancing would be different and why every institution ought to find its own path in this? I think the way that we address speech controversies when they arise, as well as the way that we create guidelines and policies, you know, before anything happens, just as a way to think about it as a community, has to reflect the values as well as the histories that are central to us. And it has to reflect the commitments of the population that we serve in some ways, right? So there are broader democratic as well as legal structures that of course we have to honor, right? The First Amendment applies to everyone. It applies in different ways to public and to private institutions. But I actually, as somebody who works at a private institution, I actually feel like in the vast majority of cases, we have to act as if we were public institutions, because we are in fact public in more important ways, even as we are private in our legal stance, right? So we're let public. Me ask you, want to press you a little bit on this, and I completely okay. agree with you that private colleges should adhere to the same First Amendment rules that public universities do. It also shouldn't be that the University of Virginia or University of California are in a more difficult position 
have to host these speakers and private colleges can just opt out. It would not be the right thing because the purpose of college is, as you said, the vetting of as many viewpoints as possible. Then when you get to the difficult cases, the difficult cases are the ones who are smuggling in under the name of free speech, something that I think the university actually has no business in dealing with. And I've written about this and I know people disagree with this strongly. I say there are some ideas beyond the pale that do not merit further debate because they've been settled. It's, to use an analogy from science, sort of these are paradigms that have been settled or have been superseded. So anybody who believes in the planet Vulcan, which doesn't exist as far as we know, or does not believe in gravity, it's not even something you raise at all, right? You just sort of, or that the sun is not the center of our solar system. Those things have been settled. We don't even engage it. But the people who come in, tend to never be those people who are controversial about because they challenge our conception of the solar system. They always talk about race. They always talk about the hot button issues in America, which are racial inequality, which are gender inequality. And somehow that doesn't seem to be incidental. That doesn't seem to be, by coincidence, the really controversial speakers really are the ones who come with pseudo-scientific ideas for racial inferiority, or as you lay out in your book, the kind of random arguments that gay people are mentally sick, women are meant to be only in the home and not work and do sophisticated work, and that uh, black people are genetically inferior. So these people are there and they're saying, well, free speech, we have to look at these viewpoints and debate them. And I would think not worth debating. We actually no. don't debate that anymore. It's just been settled. So in some ways here, the tension becomes really difficult because are they here <clears throat> to present a viewpoint we have to revisit once more and dismiss? Or are they here to undermine the university's capacity, which I'm enacting now, <clears throat> although I have no power to do so, to say, you can't come. That's just settled science. We don't need to hear this anymore. Publish it somewhere, but it's been laid to rest. Great. So two points. One is that I actually think some of the questions about the solar system or whatnot that you put aside uh, almost jokingly actually have been some of the more challenges cases that we face, whether it's on the very margins, the Flat Earth Society, or whether more centrally climate denialism, which continues in this country to, you know, to some, rise time and again as an issue of scientific debate, even though it's a ridiculous debate to have, but even the president is having it, right? And other people in the mainstream conversation are having this debate. And so I think our, let's say, environmental science department ignores it to its own peril in the sense not that they need to debate it, maybe there is some merit to it necessarily, but because they do need to model to their students how it is that you engage in this debate in a democratic way, in a way that contributes to the civic debate, and in a way that elevates science as we understand it, and, right? And you okay, so but putting that aside yeah. and the more central issue that you raise, I agree with you. I don't find any merit in continuing to debate the questions that you mentioned as the marginal questions that are repeatedly being brought to our door. Institutionally speaking, though, I would insist on a seemingly administrative distinction, which I think is important. As a private institution, like where I work, which doesn't have to be neutral about speech in the same way that public institutions are. If a person with this type of views and with a public record of being an agitator, a propagator, and somebody who is not coming to have a debate, but is just coming to raise these perspectives for political gain, if they want to rent a space at my university the way that they did at Michigan and Florida and other places, I don't think I have to accommodate that. The security costs are going to be very high. The gain for knowledge is pretty much zero from where I stand. I don't see a value in that. However, if a student organization, right, this is my administrative distinction here. If a student organization has an interest in bringing in a speaker, which I don't think has any value in their perspectives, 
I think I have to accommodate that, you know, given normal procedures and practices and, and costs and whatever other requirements. I should not silence my own members, right, of my campus if they are looking to have a debate, even if about topics that I find to be, you know, disgusting, inappropriate, uh, hateful, right? And sometimes as an institution, I need to do, and I actually do try to promote that, I need to express that the values that this speaker brings to the table or brings to the conversation are not the values of the institution. And maybe even they stand in contradiction to the values of the institution. However, I am either legally required or committed as a matter of democratic practice to allow members of my institution to organize their own events as they see fit. So, and I can recommend alternatives, you know, for people who don't appreciate that. So in this case, the, the word democratic is really central here. So you're saying your democratic commitment is that all members of the community can express their views. They can do so by inviting somebody. Other members will say, this expression interferes directly with my equal participation in this space here. And there's different ways of legally framing this. And you address it in the book and you say you recognize that students are saying to be in a room where someone says my group is either inherently inferior or ought to not be here or ought to not to exist, which we have cases of. It is not made up cases and say you should not be alive. You shouldn't exist in this country, etc. They say it's an undue burden on me to defend my existence. It's absurd for the university. And then the question is, how can the university really signal, well, we really disagree with this, but this extreme position we must have here, otherwise we're not really a democratic institution or democratically inclined. Well, so I really think that there are pretty straightforward ways of doing so when the University of Florida ended up being required by the court to have Richard Spencer present there. Their president sent out what I saw as a very effective statement at Michigan. There were similar, you know, expressions from the administration saying, look, we abhor the views that are expressed by this speaker. Because of these and those legal and democratic reasons, we have no choice or we choose to, depending on the institution, permit that. But these are not views that we stand behind. We actually stand for the opposing values. We stand for inclusion. We believe in religious equality. We believe in the dignity of all people or whatever it might be, right? Here are resources that we put in place that express these commitments. For instance, here are student groups we have, here are institutions of support or of expression that we have. Here is a speaker series that the university sponsors about, let's say, religious freedom and diversity or about Islamic thought, if, you know, in the cases where you have Islamophobes who are coming to campus and spewing hate about Muslims, etc. Right. So you can elevate. So, I, you know, I just say this. I'm not uh, fully committed to the Brandeis framework, which says, you know, you respond to hate speech with better speech. For me, at the institutional level, for institutions of higher ed, that's not enough. Right. Just to say, oh, you disagree with this view, then you just have to say your better view. That's not enough. I think the institution has to stand behind its own values and it has to express them in proactive ways. Right. But at the same time, for example, University of Florida, they had no choice. Right. They had to permit. I, this I expression. agree with you. And I think the the interesting thing is that you know, Richard Spencer has sued several universities now, and in some ways, sometimes he drops the case. And there may we at some point be a judge who actually says, no, this interferes materially with the conditions of equal participation. The university, as you recognize in your book, the courts have always recognized universities have dual missions, not just to advance any viewpoint, but actually to advance viewpoints in the interest of advancing the truth. So there may be a court case that will decide differently. It may or may not reach the Supreme Court. 
And the Supreme Court, as we know, which I find really interesting, that's why I've talked to so many constitutional experts, has been very divided, has taken a different approach, has not had the same approach. It's not a static way of thinking about speech. And I'm not advocating at all to prohibit speech. I'm saying there is speech that interferes all the time. You make this example, the, the famous example is to yell fire falsely in a theater. When there's no fire is prohibited. It is not prohibited when there's a fire. To libel a company is, or a person is actually illegal in America. It protects the commercial interests of a person before right. it protects dignity. So you cannot give a talk in your college auditorium and attack an industrialist for peddling false wares. That's actually prohibited. Right. And in some interesting way, if someone framed the case like that and say, why can Richard Spencer come here and say this? And why can someone not attack the CEO of Pepsi-Cola? in the same way then and i think this is where students are really looking for more informed conversation and saying how come one person can't come no one has a problem and the second person comes and that happens to be always the racist the white supremacist this the homophobe so in some ways i think universities are hard pressed and i think the second part of your answer the commitment of the institution to the other side of the values it's what's also being debated in our political culture right now. It touches on affirmative action. It touches on equal treatment of minorities in this country. And I think this is the political culture when universities are saying, well, we're really committed to you. We're just going to have this one day where we have this ultra offensive person. Students are saying, how committed are you really? Or are you going to be able to be committed to these if the, if the whole country shifts another way? Right, but this is a part also of our educational effort, right, because we are educational institutions, and we have to clarify, I think, to students, especially as they come from, as I said, institutional context in high school, the ones who are coming direct from high school, right, are coming from contexts where they had very limited practice in openly expressing opinions and debating them. And we have, I think, a responsibility to say both things to them, to say, first of all, when we admitted you to our university, we made a promise to you that you are welcome here and that we see you as an equal member of our campus and we would like to stand behind this promise and we would like to fulfill it and make sure that you are indeed welcome here in all your glory, right? Everything that you have to offer. At the same time, we want to also press on you that permitting people to express their diverse opinions is not only important for their dignity, it's also important for all of us as a community so that we can learn to consider and argue and debate across differences. Now, in those marginal cases where the two collide, which is what we are struggling with here, I think most of the effort has to be in the direction of protecting speech, but sometimes uh, either limiting exposure or permitting the self-limitation of exposure, right? So, for instance, you can advise students, here is where the event is taking place. You don't have to be there, right? You don't have to expose yourself to these views. Here are alternative things that you can do. Here is how you can effectively be active in opposing the speech, right? And I see all of these as important ways in which the institution can support the education towards respecting free expression I'm, while I'm, maintaining... I struggle with one issues. part of your recommendation. The one I struggle with, which is Kenneth Fox, who was the president of the University of California at Gainesville, he also said, well, some people may just stay away from that part of campus today. Students were enraged and said, are you telling us, minority students especially, African Americans or Muslims or LGBT students, to not come to school today? This is what Mr. Spencer wants. So the recommendation to stay away can be misinterpreted for students to say, I am part of your student body. You are saying to me, you can stay home today. I don't want to stay home. I actually have fought for the right to be here because this country has a history of segregation and exclusion. So right. inadvertently, it, that looks like taking care of somebody, but people can interpret it and saying, I don't want my campus to be segregated today. 
And in some right. funny way, I think Richard Spencer is very clever and he wants to set it up this way. He wants to say, let me cause a ruckus so I can affect a place where only white men show up because everybody else is afraid. Wow, I've achieved my goal and the university actually helped me in that and had another little event on the other side of campus where like the multicultural people went. So I think what's tricky about the solutions, and I want to move to another part, the university's commitment of real resources to what's considered and framed today as diversity or programs. I mean, we had an editorial two days ago in the New York Times, which made me laugh out loud, that justice for women is considered a progressive cause. And this poor professor from Sarah Lawrence complained about the progressive agenda. And I thought, I had always assumed as an American citizen, justice is actually a nonpartisan issue. And he makes that, he said, there's a progressive agenda on my campus where justice for women is taught to students but they should be much more critical and see all viewpoints. <laughs> so the distortion. So, but to get to the resource part, because you're part of, you know, thinking through recommendations for the, for the university, how to balance these things. I think the other piece is, is the university putting real resources and commitments into this other part, the equality sort of part of the equation. Right. And I think a lot of universities are, and I think actually the proper way to do this right now in the current political climate is to figure out ways to put efforts, resources, real commitment into the combination of open expression and inclusion, right? This is actually what I try to do both conceptually and administratively, if the two can. And this is the real divide, right? If I can bridge the two of these. You can wear your two hats, right? I know how it feels, yes. <laughs> I think if you manage to create the conditions on your campus where you have truly open venues for expression of diverse opinions and where everyone feels included in this process, right, and in the conversation, I think this is the real step forward that we can take both institutionally and as a democracy, right? It does require a recognition by all, and that's the hard part, right, a recognition by all that everybody should be welcome to participate, no matter their identity and no matter their ideology, which are two different things, of course. In the current polarized context nationally and in the context which, as you mentioned earlier, we have an ongoing scrutiny of the media on our campuses, it's very hard to be 18 or 19 and to try out your different views and opinions. And, you know, you want to try out. What if I actually do think something crazy, right? But then the next thing you know is on cable news, right? I think, or if we have people with really bad faith ideas or with hate-based ideas or people who refuse to recognize the humanity and the basic equality of all, right? This is what challenges the conversation and makes it more complicated. So I think we can have ground rules of inclusion and within these ground rules to have a conversation about our differences of opinion and, you know, to have an open dialogue. We've missed two important things, and I really regret that. You actually have a very interesting take on civility. I'm going to yeah. have Teresa Bijan on the podcast who talks about mere civility, which you reference in your book. So I'm going to refer to her to explain that concept to us and what you just said also, which I want our listeners to really look at the difference between identity politics and ideology and why you don't think civility is really an easy way out of this. So there's a couple points in the book, which is a fairly brief book. It's a very cogently argued, so I really recommend this book strongly to our readers here. It's called Free Speech on Campus. Thank you. Sigal, I hope to have you back on the podcast later because this is an evolving conversation, but I really want to thank you for participating today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Great. Okay. Thanks. So we'll talk to you again. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Think about it. Thank you.